in those schools. And I think we also avoid using the word condoms or talking about any kind of contraceptives. So if somebody says, you know, don't use condoms, it makes them promiscuous, God doesn't like that. How would you answer that as somebody of faith? How would you address those kind of questions, those kind of comments, and say, we don't want them to teach our kids those kind of things. We don't want it in schools. I don't want my daughter coming home and telling me she got a condom. I almost launched off without a microphone. Is it working? Okay. Thank you. Um, thanks for the question. And I think that, that when we're speaking about condoms particularly, it's really good to be able to use language, which is also... I think the mic is not liking condoms. <laughs> I get that impression as well. So, so really, uh, when we're talking about condoms, and you're talking about condoms within the faith community, it's useful to also use language, which is faith-related. So you can hold up a condom, Oh, I might just have one. Oh. So you can hold up a condom and say, what is this? Is this uh, moral? Is this immoral? And people might have various opinions about that. But the truth is, it's amoral. It's just a piece of latex. And it has no morality of its own, and it has no ability to tell you what to do with it. And if it sits in your pocket, it isn't going to say, use me, use me. It's just a piece of latex. So what's important about condoms are two things. Number one, teaching people to how to use them correctly. And the second thing is to make them available. Those are the two things that are most important. And in terms of using it correctly, we have to be able to give the comprehensive sexuality education because that allows people to make the informed choices for their lives. And most frequently, I see that leading also to the delay of sexual debut. And following up on that, but why do you think parents, um, leaders, community members, why do you think they struggle with understanding that? Why, why does there seem to be a really strong barrier that they're pushing back against this? We, we very frequently say that it takes a whole village to raise a child. And, and I think one of the realities in African society is that sex and sexuality is something that we were very comfortable with. And I say were because the, the shame about our bodies and the shame about talking about sexuality, frankly, is a Western import. That's an imposition in our societies. And so part of what we have to do is try to help um, families understand that, that we need to be authentically who we are. And who we authentically are is sexual beings. Uh, th that's the one thing that we have in common. We are all sexual beings. And sex isn't just about intercourse. Sex is about the whole of our lives. It's about vulnerability. And when we're talking about HIV, it's about making informed choices. So by showing people that talking about sex and sexuality is actually quite naturally part of who we are as a society. And secondly, that our sacred texts don't stand against this, but in many senses are useful to us in terms of being able to talk about sexuality. I'll give you one example of a taboo topic. A, a taboo topic is the talking about masturbation. Mm. You just don't talk about masturbation. Right. You do it, but you don't talk about it. And so now in the Bible, we say, ah, but you see Genesis chapter 19, oh, no. Oh, and Genesis chapter 38. And, and so you start talking about the sins of Onan and all these things which don't exist. And when you talk about Genesis chapter 38 and the sin of Onan, Onan has coatus interruptus. He pulls his penis out before he ejaculates. So in other words, it's got nothing to do with masturbation. And just by looking at the text and using texts, we can give people the language and the tools to talk constructively about sexuality in a way that helps them to be, again, in a position to make informed choices for themselves. Thank you so much. In communicating some of this information to young people. 
Because I know in a country like Nigeria, we say it all the time, we're very religious. A lot of young people get a lot of their information and the decisions they make from church. Pastor said this. Some call their pastors daddy and imams, you know. They really do respect them and what they say goes. And so I am interested in, in examples of work that you've done is how do we make religious spaces, safe spaces for young people to be able to have conversations around sexuality, around healthy relationships, around gender equality. How can we do that? How does that work? Thank you. I, I think one of the first uh, clarifications I want to make is that as long as uh, comprehensive sexuality education is considered something for the youth, we will always have a problem. Yeah. The reality is we all need comprehensive sexuality education. Yes. When I was recently in, in uh, Monrovia, I asked people in a congregation during a sermon, how many of you think you should be having sex at 99? And there, there wasn't a great deal of enthusiasm. And I said, the reality is that if you're not supposed to be having sex at 99, then Abraham and Sarah aren't having any children. <laughs> so sexuality and the practice of our sexuality is about our whole lives. And we use a, a curriculum that was developed um, by the United Church of Christ um, about our whole lives. And it has a, um, a companion manual, which is faith and sexuality. And it's about age appropriate, it's about dealing with people in all age groups, and there's a new part of that curriculum now that's just been developed for sexuality and aging. Because it is about our whole life. So I think that, that we stigmatize sexuality by thinking that it's just for the youth. It's not. It's for all of us. So, so um, I believe that the faith community can play a critical role in terms of providing sex and sexuality education and comprehensive sexuality education. And part of what we need to do is by working with our parents and with our adults in the congregations, we can free them to be able to understand that their children can talk about these things as well. One of the models that has been used there is that the curriculum that is used for the children are used at the same time for the parents. Mm so that they can go home together and talk about what they learned today. And I assure you, many times it's the parents leading and uh, learning more than the children. Exactly. But uh, from what you explained as an activist, it raised one of my concerns. Um, is this service comprehensive and does it include LGBTIQ children? Thank you. All right, so can we get some answers to that round of questions, if we can? And so, Patricia? So I get to answer the, the last question first. Yes. Thank you. Uh, yes, it does. And it speaks about the diversity of sexuality, but um, usually it only starts um, looking at the diversity at age group 12. So. Um, there is an age-appropriate aspect to it, and, and the, the levels of information that you get at different stages vary. So, for instance, at the age of four, what's the most important lesson to give a child? Not think about sexual orientation, but think about the fact that you are beautifully and wonderfully created by God, your body is to be celebrated, and you have the right to say, no, I don't like it if you touch me 